right, folks, it's two o'clock. Uh, doors are locked from the outside. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Game of Preservation Crisis. It is our slightly clickbaity title for this presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Phil Salvador. I am the library director at the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit out in California that is helping preserve video game history. Uh, and joining me today, unfortunately, uh, our co-panelist is a local, and she wasn't able to make it in because of the weather, and DC shuts down if there's any amount of snow at all. Uh, so joining us remotely is Meredith Rose. Meredith, please introduce yourself. Everyone's waving hello to you. Oh, hello. I was on mute. Uh, I was about to start off by saying I'm a tech policy advocate, but then I started on mute. Um, <laughs> So yeah, my name is Meredith Rose. I am senior policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. Um, we're a DC-based uh, nonprofit consumer advocacy organization. So we do a lot of tech policy stuff writ large, uh, everything from net neutrality to privacy to antitrust to AI, God help us. Uh, and I am the head of our intellectual property slash copyright work, which intersects very neatly uh, with game preservation issues. Yeah. Uh, so Meredith is going to join us a little bit later on to talk about some of the law stuff. So we're going to send Meredith to uh, back over here for a second. Um, she might pipe in while we're talking. Uh, but I want to start things off with a statistic you might have heard. 87% um, of classic video games are out of print. Uh, before coming to this panel, who here had heard that number? How many people knew that? Wow, that's great. Okay, uh, I wrote that study about that. Um, we're really proud of that. Like, we're, uh, it was, uh, it, was, it was a group effort. It was a project we did at the Video Game History Foundation uh, with a group called the Software Preservation Network that's helping with software preservation initiatives. And we're really proud of this number because it kind of encapsulates something that I think a lot of us in this room inherently know, which is that you know, most of these games are not available. We've all had this hunch about it, but now we have a firm number we can point to. It's especially troubling because, you know, since these games are not in print, there's a good chance they're probably not coming back in print. Within our lifetimes, this 87% probably won't be widely legally available anymore. So when we say they're out of print, what we're saying is that they're endangered. Now, this is kind of a scary figure. I think a lot of people got kind of spooked by this when we put this out. But we didn't do this just to get a scary number and upset people. We had a very specific reason we did this study. Um, we know some wonderful people in our community, like uh, Meredith, copyright lawyer. Um, we've been working with the library and archives community that works with video game preservation, trying to find ways to make this easier. So for the last couple of years, we've been snowballing on something where we believe by the end of this year, we think we can change copyright law to make video game preservation easier for libraries and archives for research purposes, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, libraries, yeah. Good stuff. So that's what we're covering today. Uh, we're gonna tell you first off why we did this study. We're gonna break down what that 87% number actually means. And then we're gonna hand things over to Meredith. And Meredith is gonna tell you how the law on this stuff works and hopefully how we're planning to change that. So to start things off though, I mentioned this is for libraries and archives. The focus we've been taking with this whole thing is thinking about video game preservation for research purposes. If you're someone who's trying to study video game history, trying to study video games as media, how do you get access to this stuff? So to, to kind of break this down and explain how we were approaching this, let's think about this from the perspective of a different medium. If you're someone who's studying, let's say, film, and you're trying to access a movie from the 80s, how do you watch that today? Well, there's a lot of options, and most of them come from the commercial market. You could, I mean, it's probably going to be on streaming. Uh, you might be able to get it on video on demand through, like, Prime Video or whatever the hell Vudu is. I don't know if people still use that. Um, you could probably get a new DVD or Blu-ray copy. You can probably get a really cheap DVD copy somewhere too. So there's a lot of options, and in that case, the commercial market is providing access to those. You can find some way to commercially get those films. Now, for video games, it gets a little different. If you want to play a game from the 80s, how do you do that? So let's break down all the ways you could possibly get a game from the 80s. Let's start with the commercial market, which is where we started talking about uh, videos. So video games do get re-released. Uh, video game re-releases are a great way to access things because you can get it for a modern platform fairly easily. You can get games through Nintendo Switch Online. Uh, I know the PlayStation Classic was kind of a bust, but it was a product you could buy. Like There are ways to get these things without needing specialized technology. You probably, in some cases, just get it on your phones. You don't have to buy any additional equipment, which is great, and that's great for accessing those games. But what games are actually getting re-released. The ones that tend to get put back out on these platforms are the ones that are more well-known, 
They're honestly more profitable to the ones they know they can actually make money on. It's the ones they can get re-released that the right situation is squared away on. So I think the entire field, like all of us, like MAGFest gremlins, but also like academics and researchers, we all know that you know you can't get most games, even though there are these marketplaces where old games are getting sold. Um, so I want to break down why that is, like why aren't these games getting re-released? And I think this is stuff we, again, we all kind of inherently know, but when we did our study, we got to write it down in a way that has been useful to people. Like talking to the lawyers we know, it's been useful to be like, hey, here's a thing we can cite that explains why it's so bad for games specifically compared to other mediums. Uh, so there's kind of a couple factors. The first big one is technical issues. Um, obviously, a Sega Genesis game out of the box isn't going to automatically run on a modern platform. Um, you know, so you have to either get the source code and port the game to another platform, which can be really difficult. Uh, the folks at Limited Run Games, if people know them, they estimated that porting a game to a new platform costs about $350,000. Uh, that's kind of for like the labor of people working on it, recompiling the source code, all that. So it's not cheap to do that. But then otherwise you have to use emulation and that's only just now starting to become more acceptable in the commercial market. I point to The Sims here because this is you know, a very well-known important game and it doesn't run on modern computers and I suspect that's one of the reasons why you can't get it. Like going back and recompiling The Sims to work on Windows 11 is probably very complicated and maybe not profitable. Um, the other thing is rights and licensing is a huge issue. Um, obviously there's a lot of games based on intellectual properties. There's a lot of games that like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, that features you know, real music that's licensed, it has people's likenesses, there's a lot of that thorny issue constantly coming up. But in some cases, the rights to the games themselves are unclear. Um, I love the example of No One Lives Forever because, uh, I don't know if folks know about this game series, a classic shooter, sh uh, shooter series for PC. Um, the three owners of the game, I think right now the rights are split between Activision, uh, Fox, which is now Disney, and Warner Brothers. Nobody can agree who owns the rights to the game. It's not clear if that paperwork exists anymore, and nobody's willing to pay lawyers to figure it out. So that's probably just never going to come out again, because that's in rights hell. Um, we talked with folks at Stanford who estimated that they went through all the games in their collection and tried contacting the rights holders, and between 20 and 30% of them, the, the people who are documented as the rights owners were like, we don't know who owns this anymore. So like, a lot of this stuff is just not going to come back out again. But even if that is clarified, even if you have the, the emulations taken care of, the rights stuff's taken care of, sometimes, frankly, people just don't care. Um, <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> so he, okay. It's, it's a low blow, but so this is, this is actually a really interesting case because like you only re-release things that you think there's a market for and that you care about. This was interesting. Uh, a couple years back, Sega pulled a bunch of games from the market, including Sonic 06, because they said it doesn't represent the brand anymore. We just don't want this out there. Uh, I think they did put Sonic 06 back out there again to get like the meme money from people, but like it was still this category of games. And the thing is, as the copyright owners, they are allowed to do that. Uh, the Entertainment Software Association had a quote that said something like, you know, it's the copyright owner can put things out, they can sell things, they can also not do that. That is entirely their right. But it still means these games aren't going to be broadly accessible. So again, these are things we knew, but it's good to have them all spelled out here because it shows kind of two important truths. First is, it's often impractical to re-release games. There's often not a financial reason to do so. I don't blame companies for doing it a lot of the time. Knowing how much it costs and all this, like the rights issues, there's often a reason they're not available. But the second thing that I think is important is there is one issue underlying all this stuff, and that is that classic games were not made to last. Back in the early days of the industry, and I'm saying early even in terms of like the early 2000s, these products were treated as toys. They were products. It was a thing you put out on the market and you sold to a bunch of kids and you moved to the next game. There was no notion of a reissue market or re-releasing things. If they knew they could have put No One Lives Forever on Steam, I'm sure they would have figured out some longer term rights policy. This is one of my favorite examples of this. Um, in 1983, when Electronic Arts was founded, their whole mission was they, like, they were electronic arts. They were like, we see games as art. And they had this campaign they did uh, called Can a Computer Make You Cry? And they introduced uh, eight games from eight artists. And they featured like, here are the artists, here are their games. This ad refers to these games as the universal language of ideas and emotions that was going to be bigger than movies and television, which it has at this point. But it's interesting. So they put out these eight games for Commodore 64. Uh, do you want to guess how many of these you can buy right now? It's, it's, it's one. It's actually one. Um, 
But he, so here's what happened. Um, so that's Mule by Danny Button. You can still get that one. Um, I believe, from what I can understand, Electronic Arts does not have the rights to these games. The rights reverted back to the people who made them. So first off, you have a multi-billion dollar company that no longer owns these games, can't do anything with them. I'm sure they'd love to celebrate their history, but they can't because they don't have the rights. And the rights reverted to people who are now retired or out of the industry. I don't think they're going to, like, the people who made these games aren't going to be porting them to Switch. That game of the lower right is called uh, Worms with a question mark on the end. I've always wanted to play that. Uh, I don't think whoever owns Worms uh, is going to be putting that game out on PS5 anytime soon. So we're in a place now where nobody who was involved with these is able to do anything with them because people weren't thinking about this. They weren't thinking about how are we going to sell these games 40 years later. And this really isn't uncommon. So even the games that we're saying these things are art, they're being treated disposably and thrown out and you know we have to rely on you know, wherever else we can find them. So point being, so does the commercial market meet the needs of researchers? We think it doesn't. We think this only meets the needs if you're trying to get some of the, you know, Mario's and Final Fantasies and whatnot. You're not going to get some of these more niche titles that might be of historical interest. So, okay, commercial market's not working. What other options do we have? Well, what about the used retro game market? Uh, you can... I, <laughs> I love that picture. Um, so, yeah, go on... You can go on eBay and find games, right? Um, but if we have game collectors here, I think you're aware that the game collecting market is starting to get kind of weird right now. Uh, prices are getting really expensive, and that's because it's starting to become a market the same way that like comic books became a collector's market, where it's collecting things as shelf pieces, it's not as much interest in playing the games, and especially since the pandemic, that's resulted in the price going up. But also factor in, like, let's say, you know, you're a researcher who doesn't have the classic systems. You have to get the system, possibly get a CRT, or get, like, an $800 retro tank. Like, there's all these steps involved, and it starts getting really expensive. Um, this is kind of an extreme example, but I love it. Just talking about how expensive games has, have gotten since, you know, when they were first released. Uh, we dug this out of our archives. This is a, at the Video Game History Foundation, this is a price chart from Funko Land from 1997 with the price of loose Nintendo games. So we can look through here and do a little bargain hunting. Um, I see a good one here, uh, Little Samson for 99 cents. <laughs> Um, if you don't know, that game is now selling for between two and three thousand dollars for a loose cartridge. So, okay, obviously that's extreme, right? But the point is that, like, it's not 1997 anymore. Prices of games are going up. Increasingly, it's being sought after by the collector market. If you are someone who's like, hey, I need to study Little Samson for some reason related to, like, mythology, maybe, and you don't have an NES, the price of getting into this is ridiculous, right? So, this, so looking at this, it's like, okay, so in a lot of cases, even the used market's not a reasonable option. So what other options are there? And I know exactly what everyone's thinking. Okay, what about piracy? You can just download these games, right? None of the games we're talking about are lost. You can just go online and download them right now and put them in RetroArch. You can get every game that came out before 2004 and put it on your analog pocket. <laughs> What's the big deal? I mean, I joke, I, ha I have my pocket here with me, I get it. Um, so, like, yes, piracy exists. It absolutely does. And in fact, this is often the only way to get access to a lot of classic games. It is a pretty widespread practice. And, uh, like, between us, like, show of hands really quick, who here has pirated a retro game because there is no other way to get it? Yeah, okay, right, exactly. So, like, we're all aware this is a widespread thing. The issue is that this isn't a long-term solution to this problem. Um, first off, uh, we, you know, it is illegal, and like, I don't feel comfortable in a lot of cases asking people to do that, and then also the setup of getting emulators working and all that. Um, I have a really good anecdote about this, which is I worked with a researcher once who was studying the history of Haiti, and she wanted to play an old computer game that is set in that region, and I had to show her, like, okay, here's how to set up an Amiga emulator and pirate this game, and it was like, there has to be a better solution to this. But, e but even besides those issues, the problem, too, is that this isn't... I don't think this is going to be a solution forever. You know, right now you can go to like coolfreeroms.ru and download a bunch of games, but like I don't know if that's going to, like we all see what's happening with the web right now. Like I don't know if that's going to be a solution in 50 to 100 years. So we're thinking long term with this. Like what is the foundation we can build this on? We don't want to build it on something unstable. So now we're in this place where the commercial market doesn't have what we need. The used market is kind of cost is you know impractical from a cost perspective. Piracy exists for now, but you know that's still legally gray, and people aren't comfortable with that, and that's not going to exist in the long term. So, what other options do you have? Well, the good news is libraries and archives do exist for video games, uh, and I want to walk through what this looks like because I suspect a lot of people here have not like gone to an archive to play a video game before. 
right now, it, it's actually pretty similar to a private collection. Uh, this is a picture from the Strong Museum of Play. It's our friends up in Rochester, New York. They have an incredible museum. You should go, it's great. Uh, but they have you know, games on a shelf, and that's how they're able to provide access to games, is you make an appointment, they pull the game off the shelf, they put it in the machine, you play it there. Which, you know, that's something. It's good. It's good that there's, there's anything like that people can use. The problem is that that's pretty prohibitive in a lot of cases. Uh, let's say you wanted to play like, you know, an out-of-print JRPG or something, and you're going to spend 100 hours in a museum playing the game. Like, you're showing up you know, every day for weeks in a row for eight hours a day in their reading room. You have to arrange transportation and a hotel, possibly childcare. There's a lot of stuff you have to deal with, right? So it's all these impractical barriers, and you're starting to deal with this, and you're, you're figuring out the forms you have to, and more and more, like, this starts to look like a really appealing option right now. <laughs> So, like, we compare that to, like, imagine if the only way to access a movie was a museum has a VHS copy, and you go there, and they try to remember how the VHS machine works, and they put it in, and you watch it right there. That's kind of what it is right now with video games. So, again, it's the same question. Does this meet researchers' needs? And, again, we don't think it does. And it is, it's good this exists. I've gone to these places. They're amazing resources, but it's just really impractical. So right now we're in a place where there's basically no way to readily and legally access most video games. So how do we make this better? Like what are all the alternatives? And specifically, what can we do with libraries and archives to make this easier? So there's a lot of ideas our community has been batting around. And the big one is the idea of remote digital access to game collections. Um, I'm sure many folks here have used like an emulator in a web browser. Essentially, it's the like scholarly, secure, professional version of that. The idea is if an institution like a museum or an archive has a game in their collection, you could apply as a researcher and say, hey, I need to access this game, and they could provide secure access to an out-of-print video game specifically, like not ones that are still being sold, but if it's out of print, get access to it in sort of like a locked-down emulator if you're trying to do research. We think that's a good starting place for a lot of this. I think it's a really good idea, the same way that you could you know, digitize pages from a book and provide access to that for researchers. The question is whether libraries can do this. Uh, there are some legal hurdles to this right now, and that's what Meredith is going to get into in just a second. But the point is, like, we've been batting this idea around for five years trying to figure out how best to approach it, and we have been petitioning the Copyright Office about this recently. Um, the problem is that the video game industry has not been a fan of this idea. Um, specifically, the Entertainment Software Association, uh, every time we bring one of these things to the Copyright Office, consistently they show up to oppose what I would say are even modest proposals that make this kind of thing easier. And their argument has been that there is a market for video game reissue. There is a pathway to get things out. You could put things out on Switch Online or Steam or Ant Stream. Almost said Ant Steam. There's a lot of options for getting your games out. People are putting out new games all the time. So there is this market. That's been their argument. But and effectively, they're saying if libraries could you know, provide access to games this way, they would be interfering with the, the market for you know, commercial video game sales. So it comes back to the same question we kept asking. Is the commercial market enough to prove this? And we've been arguing anecdotes at each other for a while. Every time one of these things happens, you know, they say, hey, look at all the great games that came out last year that got re-released. And we say, but what about these other games? We've been doing that back and forth. So we said, you know what? Let's prove this. Let's get some hard numbers on this. And that's why we did this study. We did it to say, let's get an actual statistic we can point to. Let's reset this conversation. Let's get it out of the realm of anecdote and get this into the realm of data. We did this to give ourselves ammo for this fight to make sure we could actually advocate for the, I think, very reasonable exemption we're trying to get. So in terms of how we did this study, uh, so there's no automatic way to tell if a game is in re-release, so it was a lot of manual work. Uh, so first thing was uh, the crowdsourced game database Moby Games. We worked with their engineers and we got an export of 1,500 random games released before 2010. Uh, we defined a classic game as before 2010 as sort of an arbitrary cutoff. That's sort of when the digital distribution of you know, era of game has started, and that's, you start getting more consistent re-releases, backwards compatibility starting around then. Uh, I don't want to make anyone feel like ancient that 2010 is now the beginning of classic games, but <laughs> it, it made sense for the argument we're trying to make here. Uh, and then we had an army of volunteers, uh, people from the Video Game History Foundation community, at least one of whom is standing in the back right there who helped out this project, uh, as well as folks from the universe. Yeah, you can applaud them, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of good folks helped with this project. Um, we also had library science students from the University of Washington iSchool helping with this, and they spent months. We went through and checked every single one of these games twice to make sure that we got this as accurate as we possibly could. 
But we also realize that's not going to get a full picture of the state of video game preservation because you can more easily get, you know, like an NES game than you could uh, some, you know, like an MSX game, right? Like so there are platforms that are more easily accessible that there are more re-releases for. So we hit on this idea of ecosystems, we called it. And the idea was let's also look at the libraries of a couple different platforms to kind of gauge what different areas of the marketplace look like. So we had the abandoned ecosystem, which is the Commodore 64. Not a lot of those games are getting re-released there's not a ton of popular interest in those games. Then we looked at one with high interest, PlayStation 2. A lot of PS2 games coming out all sorts of places. You can get all sorts of remasters, and a lot of people care about it. So that was our example of a high interest area. But then we also looked at a neglected area. Uh, I'm sure everyone is aware of the 3DS and Wii U eShop shutdown this year that happened. Or oh, last year, sorry, excuse me. Uh, a lot of Game Boy games went out of circulation during that period. So we said this is an area where there's a lot of interest, but there's just not a lot of games getting reissued for these platforms, even back when those services were available. So we said, let's look at all of these two. Let's get some counts on these. Let's you know, see how, if this kind of matches our assumption, there are some more active and less active areas. Uh, so we, we did these two, and in total, it was about 4,000 games we looked at across the entire study. And I'm just going to spoil it. Uh, it was bad everywhere. Um, everything was in bad shape. And that's unfortunately not surprising, but it kind of matched our expectations. 13% um, was the number we got for our overall sample, but uh, every single one of the ecosystems we looked at was actually under that amount. Um, it did kind of map to what we thought. Uh, Commodore 64 was the least, PS2 was the most, Game Boy was somewhere in the middle. Um, we actually did the math, and when the, the eShops shut down, half of all Game Boy games on the market went out of print, uh, which sucks. Yeah, so some of them have been coming back now. Like, thanks to the, I remember we were doing the study, and I was watching the Nintendo Direct when they announced the Game Boy thing. I just went, oh, God damn it, like, really loud in my, in my apartment. But, but we, we factored it in, and it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's still pretty bad, even with that brought back in. Um, but that 13%, again, that's the games that I think a lot of people know and care about. That's the more well-known titles. That's the one that people want to play, that there's this you know, active interest market for they can make money off of. So you, know, you can get a lot of the old Mario games and Sonic games, so this might not seem too bad out of context. But to put it in context, 13% is slightly above the availability of pre-World War II audio recordings. And it is slightly below the survival rate of silent film in America. Um, and those aren't comparable figures, you know, those silent films are lost forever, but we should not be talking about those in the same sentence. Like, these are games that came out in our lifetimes, and we're comparing them to, like, movies from, like, the Calvin Coolidge administration. Like, we should not be doing that. That's not good. Um, but believe it or not, it gets worse. Uh, we found some really worrying things from our study. Uh, first off, one of the big ones for us is games before 1985 from the sample we took, less than 3% of those are available. And those are the foundational games. That's like the early Atari stuff, early arcade games. That's like the, like the man sneezing films. Like that's like the very early, like this is, you know, people learning the language of video games. And there's not much of a market for that. People don't want to buy a lot of the really antiquated games. And that's frustrating because that's what's really interesting to historians. So there's an example of how the commercial market doesn't really meet the needs of researchers. Uh, and of course, you know, the eShop shut down, you're aware of that, uh, but there's more coming down the pipeline. The 360 store is in the process of shutting down this year. Uh, we're pretty sure the PS3 and Vita stores are coming next. They are barely usable right now. We actually figured out if you don't already have a PS3 with an account signed into the store, it is a nightmare to purchase games for it. I had to like search like PS3, login, store, Reddit to like find any solution. Uh, I talked with the lawyer and he said, um, that's not considered reasonably available if you have to look for a solution on Reddit to buy something. So, so it's pretty bad. And the point is, like, we think like, th there's a real danger that as digital platforms shut down and decay, things could get really bad. Um, the Commodore 64, from the sample we took, it was like 4.5% of that platform is available. Uh, and most of those are on a platform called AntStream Arcade, which is streaming retro games. If AntStream shuts down, that goes from 4.5 to like 0.75%. Like, so like we're putting a lot of our eggs in like just a handful of baskets. It's worrying. So things could actually get worse over time, which is really upsetting because games are getting re-released, but you also have this decay happening here. So this is obviously not good, right? This isn't a good situation, but we've been asking, so what do we want? What comes next in this process? And the thing is, I think it's really easy to dunk on the Entertainment Software Association, Electronic Arts, all these companies, 
But we talk about this, and honestly, this isn't the game industry's problem to fix. Their job is to sell you stuff. Their job is to sell you PS5s and Spider-Man 2. Their job isn't to keep tens of thousands of games that are out of print in circulation and like lose money on them. Like That doesn't make a business sense for them. The good news is there are organizations whose job is to do that, and that's libraries and archives. So we've started asking, okay, what can libraries and archives do to fix this? We keep coming back to that question. How do we close that gap? How do we make it easier to access these games? How do we get them to researchers? And that's where we're going to hand things over to Meredith. Uh, Meredith didn't have slides, so I'm just going to bring her up on the screen. But Meredith is going to talk about what this looks like on the legal side and what we are doing to hopefully change this law to make it easier within this year. Let me beam Meredith over here. Meredith, you are on. Everybody can see me? Rock and roll. Uh, Phil, can I ask you to turn me around so oh, that yeah, I can yeah. see you? I just, I will talk to you directly. Uh, I do that all the time. <laughs> Hello. All right. There's people. Rock and roll. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yes. So, as I said before, I'm Meredith Rose. Um, I am a copyright nerd. Uh, and how does copyright interact with this, you may ask? Well, copyright interacts with everything. That's the very short version. Um, the more salient version is you have to go all the way back to the late 90s. And in 1998, Congress passed this law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Which, show of hands, who's heard of the DMCA? <laughs> yeah, I figured. Um, most people know it for its uh, takedown provisions, which is sort of the most famous part of the DMCA. But there's a different part of the DMCA, and it's called Section 1201. And the idea was, back in the late 90s, a lot of content owners were worried about piracy. Um, and this idea of, like, well, we can't start making our stuff available online uh, if we know that somebody can immediately download it and then just replicate it infinitely. Uh, and so part of the DMCA, Section 1201, was considered this compromise. And essentially what 1201 says is if there is any copyrightable material and it is surrounded by a digital lock, then it is a separate offense to break that lock to get at the underlying copyrighted content. Now, it doesn't matter what you do once you break the lock. You can break the lock and just leave it there. You can break the lock and you can stare at it. You can break the lock and shut the doors again. It doesn't matter. Um, the fact that you have broken the lock is, in and of itself, a problem, legally. Um, this may have made some sense in 1998 when we were just beginning to envision digital distribution of, like, films and music and ebooks, uh, and we were not considering a future where software was in absolutely everything. Oh, no! Rare moment of credit said... Oh, Meredith, uh, you cut off for a second, Meredith. We lost, like, five seconds of you. Oh, God, okay. Uh, anyway, Congress had a legitimate galaxy brain moment um, when they were drafting this. Uh, and they thought, you know, we don't know what the world is going to look like in the future and how this is going to play out. And so what they did was they built in a safety valve. And every three years, there was a proceeding which is run by the U.S. Copyright Office, which is a sub-office living within the Library of Congress. Um, so you have to go to this little back room attached to the Library of Congress and you have to file a petition and say, I specifically, and people like me, need an exemption to this no breaking the locks rule for this particular purpose, which we think is a good purpose and is not violative of copyright law. So the first round of these exemptions were in like 2000. Um, and one of the first ones that was ever granted was the ability to break digital locks so that blind people could use screen readers on eBooks. Like very obvious kind of example. And now we're in the year of our Lord 2024, um, and software is in absolutely everything and its mother. Um, so if you have ever heard of the right to repair movement, uh, that is a thing that we do a lot of because software is in your tractor or your car uh, or your refrigerator. Uh, and so it is often used basically to prevent repair. Um, now without getting too far into that because that is not the topic at hand, the short version is that we have to show up every three years, hat in hand, and ask for an exemption to this no, this no digital lock picking rule. Um, the Copyright Office historically has been, trying to think of a diplomatic way to put it, um, <laughs> reluctant to give exemptions um, that may be anything but the bare minimum that they can get away with. Uh, and so one of the things that, um, you know, archivists have faced, and not just digit, like video game archivists, but like regular, regular ass librarians, pardon my French, um, is the ability to make materials available to their patrons. 
um, and to crack locks to be able to do that. Uh, and so the, you know, Phil can speak more to the specific history of the video game exemptions because this one's been going on for a minute. Um, but basically, the short version is right now, I believe there's an exemption that was granted in the last go around, which allows for uh, breaking locks in order to allow people on premises to access these games, as Phil pointed out, but not, it was specifically denied uh, for the ability to allow for offsite access. Uh, and part of the reason was because folks from ESA came in and they're like, well, we're we're reissuing these all the time. And also, we don't really believe, the, the quiet part that they did not say very loud, was, we also don't really believe the video game museums are like a thing, um, or the video game libraries are a thing. We think they're all just arcades, but we're I, not going to say think, that loud. Mer Meredith, uh, I, think, I think in one of their filings, they said like so-called archives or something like that. Yes, like, yeah. yes they did. Um, so it's, it's real cheery. Uh, and so, yeah, so right now we're in the middle of that process for the 2024 cycle. Um, now, it's every three years, which is kind of a misnomer because they it's a whole administrative procedure, which if you've ever dealt with one of these in the government, you know, they take a long time. So it's functionally 18 months worth of proceeding and then 18 months off and then 18 months back again. Uh, so like every day in the copyright community jokes that like this is the world's worst Groundhog Day, basically. Um, it keeps me employed so I can only complain so much. Um, but, you know, this is something that we have to show up every three years, and we have to ask again, like, I know you didn't take it last time, but please, here's more evidence. Believe us this time. Um, and so that's what's so hugely revolutionary about this game availability study, is because for years and years, ESA, who was the only one really with access to the information they needed to say this, said, like, oh, it's fine. Like, the market is taking care of it. Um, and now we can roll up and say, actually, <laughs> well, actually, um, it is not. And here's this like god awful abysmal number for availability. So that's kind of where we are right now, um, which I know is like a much less, uh, a much shorter and less sexy uh, component of all of this. Um, but the reality is that like you know, every three years people have to show up at this obscure office that's buried in the Library of Congress, and you have to ask permission to do things that seem deeply, normally intuitive to everyone other than copyright lawyers. Um, and that's how we're setting policy on preservation is like, I say this as a copyright lawyer, do not let us be in charge of anything. Um, and yet here we are. So. Yeah. Uh, so to elaborate on the, yeah, the history, to, uh, what you were saying about the history of um, the, the game specific exemptions. So uh, yeah, since I think since 2015, there's been pushes for, for various exemptions for stuff. The first one that we got in 2015 was to allow libraries to break uh, like the phone home DRN on DRM, excuse me, on video games. If it's like an offline game that just needs to connect to like Ubisoft Uplay or whatever, and that is taken offline, like we have libraries have the right to break that, which is great. But again, only for using things on site. Uh, there was a much broader push in 2018 for an exemption for um, basically letting libraries reconstruct MMO servers, and they were like, no, that's too much. That was too far. Um, in 2021, the last cycle, they got an exemption. This is enormously frustrating. I, I, Meredith, I think, will also be frustrated by this. They granted an exemption for remote access to software, but not for video games, was how they defined it. Uh, what's the difference between games and software? Uh, nobody knows. That has never been defined. Uh, I think The lobbying power of their respective lobbies. Like, that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, I think they even said, like, we're not going to try to define this. It was like, no, it's, it's absurd. Um, so so this, is, this is us coming back with the evidence saying, like, no, we're, we're going to finish the job on this one. Um, but it's, and Meredith, you can actually speak. You have done this process before. You were there in 2018, right? Many times, yeah. And we actually were, um, it was not the software side of video games. We were involved in getting an exemption in 2021 to be able to break digital locks that pair optical drives and motherboards on old consoles. Um, and we were able to come in and say, look, there is no reason that you should have three lines of code that is protected by a digital lock, which marries the optical drive of an Xbox to its motherboard and requires you to replace the entire motherboard if you need to fix a broken optical drive. Um, and people had been biting at that apple for years. And literally the only reason we were able to win at that time was because Microsoft had finally stopped offering repairs for that <laughs> generation of Xbox. And they're just like, we are all solid state hard drives now. Um, and when that happened, the copyright office believed us that like, oh, you actually do need to be able to fix these things. Um, but it is really incredible the power that the video game lobby specifically has managed to get themselves carved out of like every possible exemption that they show up in. So 
um, actually, I think the best example was we came in with that optical drive thing specifically because uh, there was a, a secondary push. Um, I couldn't call it secondary. There was a separate push specifically to get a big right to repair exemption for consumer devices. So basically the whole coalition of groups that said, look, we just need a blanket exemption to fix consumer devices. Like if you're breaking a digital lock and it's to fix your smart toaster, God knows why you'd own that, or like to fix your Chromebook or whatever, it's just a thing you bought and you have in your home, like you need to have an exemption to repair that. And we knew that video game consoles were going to be carved out of that because they always are. Um, they'd be like, yeah, any consumer device except for video game consoles. So we came in and said like, no, you actually also need this for video game consoles too. And so what ended up happening was there's a big consumer device right to repair exemption that was won in the last, uh, the last go around. And it says any consumer device for the purposes of maintenance or repair, except for video game consoles, unless it's an optical drive. Um, to, I'm dead ass. That is what it says. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if, if, this is, I was gonna this say, is the world we uh, live in. <laughs> Meredith, I was going to say, if you go to like the copyright, the section where they have all the exemptions and search for except video games, there are like many examples in there. It's absurd. Oh, yes. <laughs> so very many. Um, and I genuinely think this is like, and this is just me, like, you know, I have done these proceedings since 20... I started doing my current job in 2015. I was doing them at a previous job before that, too. So, like, I have been around the block several times. And, uh, like, hand to God, I think a large part of it is this cultural shift within the copyright office. Like, who was on the other side of this? And are they gamers? <laughs> like, do they understand video games in a way that everybody understands books, everybody understands movies and music? People don't always understand video games. So, like, I had to sit up there with a video of me puttering around in like one of the, I think it might have been Animal Crossing. It was Pocket Camp, yeah, like, was the one you were playing. It was, it was one of the Animal Crossing, it might have been New Leaf, and I was trying to explain like, yeah, this is like, it, it was a definition of what constitutes a multiplayer game, and I'm like, that's not a, that's not an easy answer. Like, what is a multiplayer game is very, like, do you want me to do Dark Souls? Like, because I can do that. <laughs> um, you know, and like, is that multiplayer? I mean, yes, but is that the kind of, it's not World of Warcraft, and so having to play this video of me like, Puttering around digging up stuff on my Animal Crossing island in front of the U.S. Copyright Office was a thing I had to do to try to form a point. Um, you know, and I think now there are, I actually know a bunch of folks who work there now who are gamers. So, like, they get this now. A lot of the questions are a lot less rudimentary <laughs> when we show up, which is a perk. Yeah, I think even if that, that was one of the nice things in the study, too, is a lot of it is just the background explaining, like, here is how a game gets published. This is what a port is. And it's like, now we have a thing we can show people and say, like, this is why games are weird compared to books and movies, which we didn't have before. So I think all this is working for us pretty well so far. We, I feel like, at least, but... Yeah, no, for sure. And there's, like, I can get into my whole political history of, like, why <laughs> there, people don't understand games quite as much on the copyright side, and it's largely because, like, ESA, and I'm, this may shock folks to hear, um, ESA comparatively doesn't get involved in a lot of lawsuits compared to all the other major media <laughs> formats. Um, video games are in a shockingly low litigation environment against their users compared to the music industry, which is a thing that I work on a lot. Um, and so there's a lot of, like, you have to understand kind of how the music industry works if you're working on copyright policy in the Hill. Most people who work on copyright policy you have absolutely no idea how the video game industry works because it does not come up with complaints on its own. Very rarely does it ever show up to say, like, we specifically need the thing. Um, mostly it's like the movie industry, the record industry, the publishing industry that come up and do it. So they kind of, like, benefit from a little bit of an aura of mystery um, up on the hill, which is very frustrating, to put it mildly. I feel like there's still, games are a novelty. It's like, oh, we're doing a thing with games now. Like, that's the exciting thing. Um, I am kind of disappointed. I thought we were going to have the coolest exemption this year, but somebody is also petitioning to let the people who work at McDonald's break the copy protection on the McFlurry machines to fix them. Which, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can all get behind that, yeah. Do, do you know who that person is, Phil? Say again? Do you know who that person is? I do not. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I have known more about the Taylor McFlurry machines than I ever needed to know. Um, you know, I mean, this is like a big right to repair thing. This is where the consoles came into it, right? It's this idea of like, the whole point of the DMCA was to like try to give 
content industries some like some like safety pat on the back that like you can release your things into the wild and there will be guardrails against them being infinitely copied and distributed without paying you for them. Um, that was the idea. What has ended up happening is because software is copyright eligible. This is a whole separate rant I will not get into. Um, <laughs> But we, we painted ourselves into a corner where a lot of like really dumb functional software is copyrightable. Um, and so what companies do is instead of using these digital locks to prevent that software from being copied and distributed everywhere, they use it to prevent third parties from repairing the stuff. They use it to lock in downstream monopolies. So like one of the biggest offenders on this is Boeing. Um, Boeing locks all of its like, so when you, this is, Utterly unrelated to video games, <laughs> unless you are big into flight simulators. Go off. Court. Um, so, so uh, there's a whole study called avionics, which is basically computer systems on big airplanes. Um, and part of what the FAA requires is that that you like basically pull in data from your sensors on your plane, and they have to come in. Like the FAA has to show up, and like you have to do certifications that like yes, I've had my sensors checked, and they're still registering all the stuff they need to register. Now. The data that those sensors are pulling in is not protected by copyright. It's raw data. It's it would be it's utter gibberish to most people. Um, Boeing still uses digital locks to control access to it, so that the only people who can get at it are certified Boeing technicians, which is functionally pushed independent repair, like independent repair for airplanes. And we're not even talking like big seven forty sevens. Like we're talking like Cessnas. We're talking small private planes. Like the independent repair market for those has. Like, it not totally vanished, but it's been crunched very hard by this kind of stuff. Uh, Mary, so, yeah, so right to repair is like a whole separate bucket, but it is all this like very cynical use of a law that was designed to do one thing <laughs> and has now shockingly uh, been leveraged to do something else in the service of furthering the interests of the people who have control of it. Uh, Meredith, I, 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 I had two more questions for you to steer us back to games. Um, I, as much as I want a panel where you just like talk about copyright for an hour, I would 100% go to that, but. Um, so I'm curious about if you can mention how games factor into this, because it, many games have copy protection. Not all of them do, but I know that doing this is, is going to have broader implications, right, for working with games. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's got a lot. So there's kind of like two, there's a bunch of different ways in which this interacts. So like, you have to be able to crack DRM for things like um, really great examples, which Phil could talk about with more detail than I can. But like some consoles, like really old consoles, just have a shelf life and they will just go poof after a certain amount of time. Um, your Game Boy cartridges, your old Game Boy cartridges have an internal battery, and when that goes poof, goodbye to the game. Um, and so you do have these like physical limitations that you have to be able to overcome in order to preserve a game. So that's one. There's the other question, which is like, if you can get your hands on a game, then there's a digital lock around it, and you have to be able to crack that to get at it in other ways. Um, one of the fun things, for me at least, is what can what constitutes a digital lock? Because video games have been around for a long time, so it's like, what are we? And this this law dates to 1998, which is like pretty. That is a that is a fresh that is a fresh baby of a tech law by con Congress standards. Like this thing is an infant. Um, and so you know, copy protection back in 1998 was if you remember, if you ever had a VHS and there's that little tab of plastic that if you broke it off, you couldn't record on the VHS anymore. But if it was still there, you could over record. What was in there, and so you could like find an extra piece of plastic and tape it on, and like suddenly you could record over this, or like CDs for a long time. When I was in when I was in high school, you would get a CD that was copy protected, and what you did is if you looked at the flat back of it, you'd have a ring, you'd have an external ring, and then you'd have a little gap, and then you had the internal ring, and the external ring was just junk data. So the idea was if you tried to put it in like a computer CD-ROM drive, it wouldn't be able to read it. But guess what? You could beat it with a sharpie. You could literally just sharpie over the ring, and it would just load straight into your... And it was fine. So, you know, part of it is a very, very dumb arms race <laughs> that you have to just kind of, like, keep up on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it. nowadays you've got these other really weird things that you're dealing with. Um, so games which are... And this is... I'll talk, actually, about this in terms of movies, because movies have really... The Netflix model is a, is coming for everybody. And it's very worrisome. Uh, Meredith, um, I, don't know, so, I don't know if you caught this, but just recently an executive at Ubisoft made some statement about how we're going to have to start transitioning away for an ownership model for games, and people will be fine with so it bad. because those games will always so be bad. there. Which This was this was a big thing in the Microsoft Activision 
acquisition was they're like, we're going to move Game Pass. Everything's going to be available streaming on Game Pass, which, like, there's a lot of things wrong with that. One, you're assuming everybody has a robust enough broadband connection to download these things. I also work on broadband policy. Hi. I have problems with this assumption. Um, but two, like, these are huge preservation problems. I mean, if you've got Netflix, like, you know, I... So one of the weird things is that in order to be considered for certain award shows, and I don't know if this is still the case, but for a very long time, you had to make physical copies of your like nominated media available in order to be considered for these award shows. So you get Netflix printing these like micro runs of DVDs of Netflix original shows, like Orange is the New Black. Um, like HBO would do like a micro run of Game of Thrones. Um, though I think HBO stuck with the DVD game longer than some. But like the importance of having these things available on physical media that is not constrained by just like some corporate bottom line or if like if they do the HBO thing and they're just like, we need a tax write-off, let's dump 80% of our archive. RIP uh, Infinity Train. What's that? It's an RIP Infinity Train. I know, it's just, uh, I have feelings. Um, so, you know, we've seen this happen in other places. We've seen situations where um, like the Criterion Collection. Criterion has its own streaming service, um, which I will say as a consumer, I actually really like the Criterion Collection. They do like curated little channels where the, they had an entire series on Japanese film noir, where they have like little explainer videos between each of them about like, here's an expert talking about the context of this movie and what you should look for. It's a great like educational value. They will not allow uh, institutional subscriptions for like colleges and universities at any price. They just straight up will not take universities and colleges as consumers. Um, and so you have these like enormous loom, you have a preservation cliff that we're about to run off of. And games are chugging up along to that cliff along with everything else. Um, so the ability to like capture streaming only shows for archival purposes is like a very live debate in both in like this 1201 exemption setting that we've been talking about and just generally in copyright land. Yeah, and I think that for games, that is, a, I think, a future problem. I think right now we're, we're trying to stop the bleeding of what already exists currently. But that's, yeah, on the radar for things we have to continue thinking about. Um, Meredith, before we go to questions, one thing if you can tell people, what's the timeline on this, this process we're doing? Because I promised earlier we're going to have this hopefully figured out by the end of the year. So what does that look like? What's the rest of the year look like the process? Sure. Um, so, uh, this is a government proceeding, which means there's all kinds of rounds of comments and reply comments and objection comments and yada, yada, yada. But the very short version is the proponents, I'm going to shorthand us, the good guys, our comments all went in uh, right before Christmas. The opponents slash bad guys, if you're following along at home, uh, their comments are due at the end of February. And then we're going to have to come back and yell at them one more time. Uh, and then probably sometime in April, there's going to be big roundtables where they get everybody together in a room and there's a lot of finger pointing and trying to make points on each other. At which point the copyright office will like take everything they've learned and they will sort of go back into their layer. And then uh, by the end of the year, knock on wood, they will have an answer and they will release it with little to no warning. <laughs> and then it will just be hoisted upon us. Um, and that's when we will know. So the idea is once in a blue moon, it will go over. I think one year it went like a solid like six months into the following year. Um, but likelihood is probably like September to November of 2024. We'll have an answer. We're just gonna spend the whole fall on pins and needles. It's gonna be a mess. Um, so uh, that is all the like prepared stuff we had. So I'm gonna turn it over to questions now if I can zoom Meredith back here. Um, so there's contact info. Uh, I'll, I'll bring Meredith back on if you have a question for her, but uh, let's do some Q&A. Uh, hands, you in the front first. What's to keep uh, games from like 20 plus years ago from going to public domain? <laughs> uh, the question was, and Meredith, you can chime in on this too, about what's preventing games from 20 plus years ago from falling into the public domain? Because the public domain for like works for hire right now is 95 years, right? It's not, it's, it's, we're, it's yeah. gonna be a while before we get any of that in the public domain, unfortunately. Yeah, copyright term. Um, right now, the length of copyright duration for a thing is if it's made by a person, like an identifiable individual or joint author, it is that life of the longer, if you have joint authors, it's whichever one of you lives longer. As soon as the longer lived one kicks the bucket, that starts a 70 year clock. And when the 70 year clock is up, that's when something enters the public domain. Um, stuff that was made by a corporation has a 95 year term. Um, so when in doubt, 95 years from the date it was published um, is when things are gonna go up. So, so uh, 2080, you know. Super Mario Brothers enters the public domain if any of us are alive then. 
Also worth noting that, like, uh, you know, when something enters the public domain, it's just that specific work and not necessarily later iterations on it. So, like, the big example for this was Steamboat Willie, uh, January 1st of this year, finally entered the goddamn public domain. Um, <laughs> genuinely, a bunch of us were afraid that we were not going to live to see this, that, like, Disney was going to swoop in, like, at, like, 11.59 on New Year's Eve and be like, surprise, another 20 years. Um, but, uh, no, so that Steamboat Willie is in the public domain. Later iterations of Mickey Mouse are not in the public domain. <laughs> Mickey Mouse as a concept is not yet in the public domain. It's just Steamboat Willie. So, you know, when you get the original Mario Brothers, that's going to go in. But, you know, the subsequent, like, Super Mario Brothers, yada, 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 all the subsequent ones, those are going to have their own timelines. Is there a precedent for anything entering the public domain sooner? Or do being more uh, Meredith, if you couldn't hear the question, it was, is there a precedent for other things entering the public domain ahead of time, essentially? Or people maybe even relinquishing the rights to things in the public domain? And for games, apart from, like, indie stuff where someone might be really motivated, I can't think of a lot of examples of that. Yeah, so there's two kinds of... There, so, it's complicated. This is my lawyer, my lawyer bit. It's complicated. Um, <laughs> just my, I just need a t-shirt that just says it's complicated. Um, the, so there's a couple of different ways of thinking about this. So the way that the law is actually written, copyright just happens. It's like a, it's like a force of nature as far as the law is concerned. It just it exists and it vests and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so that's the strict reading of the law is you can't give something up before the end of its public before the end of its copyright term. Now, in practice, there has been a push by a lot of authors to deliberately commit their works to the public domain. So, like Tom Lehrer, um, like dedicated all of his songs to the public domain a couple years ago. Um, now, the law doesn't have a mechanism, doesn't have any baked in mechanism to recognize this is the problem. So, actual lawyers are staring at that, going like. If we litigated this, we're not sure it would actually hold up. But people have done that. Oh. Um, and the third, oh, sorry. The third I, thing. Sorry, Meredith, I think okay. I took you off screen. There we go. Back up. There we are. I'm okay. there. Sorry. Rock and roll. We're good. Um, so the third thing is there's this problem of things called orphan works, which is like something that Phil touched on a bit. Um, but orphan works are basically, we know when it was published, pr roughly, we know enough to know that it is almost certainly still under copyright. We have no idea who the rights holder is. Um, and either it's a lack of paperwork, or sometimes there's paperwork and the rights holder has died, and then there's an estate, and we don't know what part of the estate, or maybe they didn't have an estate, maybe they died and test it, we don't know. Um, and there's no reasonable way to track down who the owner is. This is, the orphan works problem has been the subject of debate for like a minimum of 15 years, <laughs> like as long as I have been working in this field. Um, and there's no ready solution to it yet, yep. but it is like a really well-known problem in copyright. Now, having said that, someone can still pop up out of the woodwork and sue you, and you'd have like no real defense against yep. it. Uh, I will also add, I think there are some very early games that were made at like universities, I think maybe in the public domain because they were like, made at public universities and that's just kind of public ownership, but it's not clear, nobody's tested that, and in most cases those games aren't really easily playable, so we had a couple of those come up in the study and we said no because even if it's in the public domain, there's not a way you can get to it unless you can like compile the raw code for like a supercomputer from the 70s, so that, we don't think that counts. Challenge um, accepted. Yeah. Uh, question back there, yes. yes. You, oh, uh, in the blame, in the, in the uh, 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 white hair, black outfit. You, yes, you. Yes, Great. yes, you're standing up. <laughs> That's a good question about like legally how we're defining, we're dealing with things like ports, I think is the way you're putting it, where it's like things on different platforms and like how we kind of litigate the differences and all that. Is that kind of what you were, were curious about? Yeah, like what defines the video uh, I, I don't know, Meredith, if you know if there's a definition of how, the, how a platform is considered. Uh, I'll say how we approached it for the study we were doing. We set sort of an arbitrary standard where we said if there's a significant difference in versions, we define that as being effectively a separate work, which is arbitrary, but our thought was like, if you're a researcher, is this effectively going to be the same thing? 
and you can get really nitty gritty on that. Like, um, if it's, you know, if you're doing like the Super Nintendo and Genesis version, like the palettes are different. Like, if you're someone who's studying game art from that era, maybe that is a meaningful difference. But as far as we're concerned, that's kind of the same thing for the sake of what we did. I think, and Meredith, you can elaborate on this, but I think the kind of thing where it's, because fair use is very squishy, I think it's the kind of thing where it's going to vary in a lot of cases, because there might be reasons to have, if you want to have the crappy version of Doom, like there might be a legitimate research reason to have access to that, even though the game itself is on sale. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Meredith. Yeah, so the difference, like what constitutes, so uh, the, one of the things that we end up arguing about quite a bit is like, is uh, and this this came up again in the the uh, Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition was you know the talk about like well what would their share of the video game market be and trying to there's like three people in my office who are video gamers and we were trying to explain to like antitrust people who are not video gamers about you know the the Microsoft argument was well there's the Xbox there's the PlayStation and there's uh, whatever that fancy Nintendo thing is right now <laughs> the Switch. Um, that, to put it clear, that characterization did not come from us. Um, but, uh, you know, and so we were like, no, 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 There's, there's, first off, the Switch is like its own market. Like, it's got its own demographic targets. It's got its own library. You're not going to get game. You get cross-pollinization between the Microsoft and the, and the PlayStation games. And also, you need to consider PCs as, like, a gaming platform for the purposes of talking about this. And we got into a lot of arguments about this, about whether PCs are a gaming platform. And it's like, well, yes, they are. They also do a lot of other things. Is that enough for the purposes of, like, ye archaic antitrust law? to affect the market analysis. So the version is like, no one has a good answer to this. Um, and it really just, it depends on who you're talking to and in what context. All right, uh, question, uh, other person who I didn't call on. Yes, Blackshirt, back there. Oh, I, actually, uh, uh, person in the back, they'll get you next. Uh, yes, you first, yes. So playing devil's advocate. All right. Uh, so the question was, Devil's Advocate, how representative is 1,500 games? So we did the stats on this. We did the work on this one. Uh, based on the total population of games in the category we were looking at on Moby Games, we believe with a sample of 1,500, the results are going to be within a margin of error of 2.5%. So that gets us anywhere in the range of like, you know, around like 11 to 15% is probably, if you did every game, it would be within there. But that really establishes, even if it's a little higher or a little lower, if, you know, we're not talking about 30% or 40%, it's going to be much lower. Uh, for the console ecosystems, the margin was much smaller, uh, sorry, larger on a lot of those because we had a smaller sample, and that was more in like the 4% range. So PS2 could actually be as high as like maybe 16%, but we feel, based on the stats, 95% confident that our results are going to be in the neighborhood of 13%. Um, but we, I don't know stats super well, so we consulted with some good folks at the University of Pennsylvania who helped, <clears throat> helped us out on that part of it. Uh, we actually tried to make this report as boring as possible and as thoroughly done as possible just so it was good evidence. We didn't want to just go in and wing it. It's like, no, we did the stats on this. This is how math works. So thank you for asking that because that was on our mind for the first like couple months of this project. Yeah. And now you. Yes, finally. <laughs> So we love this question. It's how do you preserve a live service game? And the example we love is like, how do you preserve Fortnite? And I think it's a really good example because, yeah, that's like, so on the one hand, like when the server's shut down, you can't play it anymore. Um, and there are cases where like the servers come back online. I don't know if people saw this, but um, uh, whoever the owners of City of Heroes are, the MMO, recently licensed an official fan server for the game, which is wild to me. But, ev but even in those cases, arguably, it's not the same game because it's not what people were playing back in the day. Like, it's not the same community. Like, if you could preserve World of Warcraft, you're not going to get, like, you know, the Corrupted Blood event or anything like that. So the approach, I'm going to steal this. I always say I steal this. It's from John Paul Dyson at the Museum of Play we mentioned earlier. The way he's mentioned it is he says we have to think about it like preserving the concept of baseball, where we're not going to be able to preserve a stadium and keep the entire, like, 23 Dodgers on ice for the rest of their lives. The idea is that we, we can start documenting this, though. And so for a lot of it, it's like documenting what's happening in fan communities, interviewing people, recording streams of what's happening. Like, a recorded stream of, like, the concerts that happened in Fortnite, I think would be much more valuable than being able to log onto Fortnite and you're just one person in a completely empty server. So I think in a lot of that, we have to get comfortable with the idea of loss. Like, I want to encourage companies to donate servers and stuff, but also maybe start thinking about if this thing is not going to exist in the long term, how can we preserve and document the experience so people can understand what it was? Because I think for live service games, that's what's important about it. 
Um, it's, it's, it's a good well, question. And, like, it's one that comes up a lot. Um, and I'll, I'll just pipe in oh. real quick. Um, just World of Warcraft. I, I, if anybody remembers the, what is it, Nostalrius server? That, so there was a fan-made Vanilla WoW server um, that got taken down by Blizzard. Um, but Vanilla WoW, so I played World of Warcraft when it first came out. I stopped around 2005, early 2006. I did not play it for very long. But, like, I spent a decent amount of the end of my high school career on it. Um, and it is a very different game. Like, the current World of Warcraft is utterly unrecognizable if you played Vanilla WoW. And so when we talk about preserving, um, you know, a game with a, uh, a server-side element, you have to, there's, you know, fundamental preservation question of which iteration of it are we preserving. Um, and ideally, the answer can be all of them. Uh, but, you know, there's certain value judgments you have to make and what you preserve and what you don't. Yeah. Uh, we got time for one more quick question. So, yes, you in the pink hoodie. What do we do locally? What do we do locally? Um, I mean, like, is it like what you can do or? Yeah, so the piece of advice I love giving, and this is specifically going back to that last part, is document your own spaces. If you are part of a gaming community, talk to people, record some videos. Uh, Kevin over there knows, like, the fighting game community, like, recording tournaments and stuff. That's a huge part of it, and capturing the culture. Like, the Daigo tape from, like, that, that from Evo, that's a huge deal. Like, capturing some of that. If you're at MAGFest, take pictures of all the cool indie booths. Take home merchandise. Uh, when we go to the Game Developers Conference, we take every single flyer we can find from every booth. Which is really funny because there was one year when it was like all blockchain games. So now we have like the, that blockchain is not going to live forever, but we have the physical evidence that of what was happening there, which is really funny. But like, but non sarcastically, like find stuff in your own spaces, find the stuff you care about. Uh, if you're in a community, like if you're at a, a college and there's indie devs, talk with them about finding ways to donate their source code somewhere. Like start. Everyone wants to like preserve Zelda or something, but like the, the work starts in local communities and what's happening in our own spaces. Reco like you know, say, if you're a Twitch streamer, save your stuff, have it somewhere. Like it it starts small like that, um, and that's I think a really good note to end on. Um, so I'll be up here for a little second. Uh, I have nothing going on until Lacey Johnson at six thirty. That's going to be such an amazing show. Uh, so we can talk. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. This was terrific. Thank you for. Uh, <laughs>